I recall one of my former owners, Mr. Thomas Moore, once saying that Negroes never committed suicide. I recollect the exact situation. Hall killing time and Moore's puckered, pockmarked face as he labored at the bloody carcass and the exact words spoken to two neighbors as I stood by listening. You ever heard of a nigger killing himself? <laughs> <laughs> no, I figure a doctor, he might want to kill himself, but he gets to thinking about it, keep thinking about it, thinking and thinking, and pretty soon he's gone to sleep. Ain't that right, Nat? Yes, sir, Master Tom. That's right. Sure enough. I had to admit to myself that I'd never known of a Negro who had killed himself. And in trying to explain this fact, I tended to believe that in the face of such adversity, it must be a Negro's Christian faith which swerved him away from the idea of self-destruction. But now, as I sit here amid the incessant murmur and the buzz of flies, I can no longer say that I feel this to be true. It seemed that rather my black shit-eating people were surely like flies, God's mindless outcast, lacking even that will to destroy by their own hand their unending anguish. How would anybody seeking to organize his people to struggle for their own liberation have that perception of them? It was an act of arrogance coming out of a profound ignorance that led him to think he could restructure that experience in anything that would be a credible way or a way that reflected anything that an informed black person would know of our own experience and to make it acceptable to black people. Novels can be good, novels can be bad, but I think it's different to say that than to say you shouldn't have written this in the first place because you were white or what are you doing to our history uh, by creating this um, character about whom we feel deeply ambivalent. And believe me, I think that it was the sexuality of Nat Turner that bugged people the most, no matter how they justified it. I think that without that, the novel would have passed through without a peep. It was perfect because it was set in the first century Rome. The place where her breast had met my arm was like an incandescence, tingling. Again, I was smothered by remorseless desire. And suddenly I found myself measuring the risk. Take her, take her here on this bank by this quiet brook. Forget your great mission. Abandon all for these hours of terror and bliss. You should read some of my poetry sometimes. Being attracted to and repelled by uh, members of the opposite sex strikes me as the most natural thing in the world. And to have left that out, to have rendered Turner incapable of that kind of internal struggle, would have reduced his humanity. I think Starr knew exactly what he was doing, and I think he did the right thing. We have to deal, as black people, with so much of this kind of stuff, not so much in the writing, but in our everyday lives. What Styron had done was play at the worst fears of white America, and I think, frankly, fantasizing in his own mind as a white male about the lustful feelings that black men had for white women. I didn't want a white woman, you know, and I didn't know any of my brothers who did. And, um, he, but he did, you know, he said that Nat wanted one. And not only did he want one, that he was willing to kill for it. And not only that, that, that was his primary motivation. R liberation was irrelevant. It was, it was sexual, unbridled sexual lust or something like that. What really would have uh, caused rage on the part of the black critics would have been, I think, if, if they had had a consummated sexual relationship. Um, which would really have proved um, the, my own racism. But uh, actually, the, the relationship between Nat Turner and Margaret Whitehead is infinitely more complicated. It's, it's as much filled with rage and hatred on Nat's part than any kind of unrequited love.
shut your eyes. I hurt so. He does at the end realize the horror of having killed this woman out of his rage. And I think that Nat Turner's feeling of, of, of love at the end is really uh, an attempt to express his own sense of, of, of reconciliation and redemption and has very little to do with any, um, any direct human connection. I think this is an abstraction. At least that's what I was attempting to do. It struck me as a great irony that I began to write Nat Turner the summer of Martin Luther King's great speech in Washington. And it was a time of reconciliation, of nonviolence, of peacefulness, a sense that blacks and whites could work this thing out together. But by the time I finished the novel, in 1967, this sweetness and light that Martin Luther King was predicting had turned into a kind of hellish nightmare on the racial scene. And so Nat Turner appeared, my Nat Turner, appeared at a time when this, this dream of, of Martin Luther King's had evaporated. So uh, there was good reason why my book was met uh, with such mixed reactions. Yeah. Right. If anyone has ever lived with a nonviolent movement in the South, from Montgomery on through the Freedom Rides and through the sit-in movement and the recent Birmingham movement, and see the reactions of many of the uh, extremists and reactionaries in the white community, uh, he wouldn't say that this movement makes, uh, or this philosophy makes them comfortable. Uh, I think it arouses uh, a sense of shame within them often, in many instances. I think it uh, does something to cut, touch the conscience and uh, establish a sense of guilt. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt-evoking act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. But this, uh, this approach certainly uh, doesn't make the white man feel comfortable. Yo, now check out the next video. You thought that was tight. The next episode is going to be even tighter than this episode. You follow us and you guys will see the best of the best. Minister Malcolm, you have suggested that there are all kinds of movements in Harlem growing that you and I don't know about? Oh, yes. Uh, frustration itself has been, has been sufficient. All that was necessary to make Negroes realize the the importance of banding together and negroes are banding together banding together in what kind of movements uh different kinds of movements all kinds of movements and and they remain almost invisible they remain almost unknown but yet they are there when i say invisible i mean invisible in the sense that their existence is unknown and no matter how much you try and track them down you can't find them and never try and find them through the negro leaders the Negro leaders are famous as apologists. If you recall, one of the most famous Negro leaders in 1959 was asked by you uh, about the black Muslim movement. And he said he knew nothing about it. And the next moment, you flashed a picture on the screen with him shaking hands with me. So uh, if you will recall... <laughs>